Hey Froggy friends, Kiro Style here and welcome to the Tier List Maker! Thank you so much for joining me here on stream today. Hey Sai, welcome to the stream, thank you for being first. Kieran, it's good to see you. Geb, thank you so much for stopping by. Luke, it's good to see you. And Gora, welcome, welcome. And Riske, thank you so much for coming to the stream today, everyone. So, this stream is a result of one of your rewards from the Thank Miss Charity stream that we did a couple weeks ago. And so you unlocked the tier list streams. So I asked you guys what were some ideas for tier lists we could make. And a lot of you had some really good ideas. And there were a lot of game ones. So it was like, rate video games, rate video game characters, rate video game antagonists, rate games that you played. So I thought I would start by doing a big tier list of all the games that we've streamed together here on the channel. And... I'll do more tier list stuff in the future, because this stuff's kind of fun. So I'll, I'll still go through some of the other ideas that people sent in the future. So if your idea wasn't picked, don't worry. But I think this is a good one because we're also reaching the end of the year. And it's kind of a nice way to look back on three years of hero style. And I kind of already want to do this stream anyways. I was already kind of planning to do something like this anyways. So I think this is kind of a nice segue into that. So we've played a lot of games on the channel over the last three years. So I organized the games according to year. And within the year, the tier list maker automatically sorted it into alphabetical order. So I'm going to do them year by year. We're going to start with my first year, 2021, and then move to 2022, and then 2023. So I had to think about different ways to set up the tier list. Now, I knew I was going to do like a letter grade system. S at the top, A, B, C. I wasn't really sure how far down I'd go. But then I thought that there's a lot of variation within what I would consider A and B. But I didn't want there to be too many categories. So at first I was thinking, maybe I just do A plus, A minus, B plus, B minus. But then I was like, that doesn't really make sense because you still need like a, like a, just a regular A or just a regular B. So in the end I went with A plus, A, A minus, B plus, B, B minus. And then we have the S tier, which is a tier on its own. And then we also have like C tier. I don't think I've really played too many games that are like worse than C tier, I would say. And then I made a couple special categories. So one category is just called special. Because I think that some games are kind of hard to rate. Because maybe they're just a demo or something. Or it's like a small team or a proof of concept. And then I put a, a section for... I, I put multi for multiplayer. Maybe it's better if I call it, like, party games, because a lot of the games that we play with other people are, you know, kind of hard to rate, right? Because it's basically it, it based on who you play with, right? Let's put, let's put party games. I, mean, I think that makes a little bit more sense. Party games. Okay. So... I'm going to start with going through them by year. So here's all the games I've played on this channel. And I think we're at about 80 games, give or take a little bit. Some games I split into two. Like, for example, Great Ace Attorney. I split into Great Ace Attorney 1 and Great Ace Attorney 2 because they were both long enough on their own that I think it's fair to consider them two separate games. But then some games I left together, like for example, Layers of Fear is actually a compilation of Layers of Fear 1 and Layers of Fear 2 plus new content. But altogether, we spent like only a couple streams on it, so I feel like I could still call it one stream. Or for example, Xenoblade 2 Torn of the Golden Country exists as its own separate game you can get, while Xenoblade Future Connected can only be played with Xenoblade 1. Or Xenoblade Future Redeemed can only be played with Xenoblade Chronicles 3. So those ones were still considered one game. So it actually doesn't really look like a lot of games when I look at it like this in a spread, but it's actually a lot. Like it is actually like close to 80 here. <laughs> but um, we're going to go through them by year. Hey Ash, welcome to the stream. Thanks so much for stopping by. 
I also, I was thinking like this could be a yearly tradition, whether it's a stream thing or just a video thing. Every year we could update the tier list with the games we played over the last year. So that's why I'm doing them all on one tier list spread instead of doing three separate tier lists. Also because the first two years I didn't play as many games, so it, there's not as much. And I think it's kind of a nice to have a, like a benchmark. So for those of you that might not know when we played each of the games, so uh, year one, again, Within the year, it's organized alphabetically. So we have I, the Somnium Files, and then it ends off with the Great Ace Attorney 2, which is here. So everything on this first row is something that we streamed during the first year, 2021, the first year of Chir the, the first year of Kiro Styles channel. Year two, we start off with 13 Sentinels. So that's over here. And we ended. What did we end with? We ended with, at least on this, with Zero Escape 999. So everything between here, 13 Sentinels, and Zero Escape was year two in alphabetical order. And then this year alone, we played a lot of games, Pro possibly because I mean, a big part of it was because October, we played a bunch of scary games, and those are shorter. So everything from Alice, Madness Returns, all the way to the end of the list, World of Horror, that was this year. Like, look, this year is half of this tier list alone. Actually, can I zoom in? Or I can zoom in. Does it look good zoomed in, though? Yeah, that looks pretty good zoomed in, I think. Yeah, so everything from I, the Somnium Files, to Greatest Attorney 2 was 2021. Everything from 13 Sentinels to 999 was 2022. And then everything from Alice until the end was 2023. Okay, so let's start with 2021. So in other words, this first row and a little bit. Now, yeah, it's kind of neat to see you guys remembering like which game you stumbled upon the channel with and it kind of like especially if you go back to my youtube and look at like the playlist or the order of the videos it's kind of neat to walk back through it be like oh yeah i remember this or i remember i joined here and then i like watch this it's kind of like a trip down memory lane sometimes i just scroll through my videos just to relive like oh yeah i played this game and then i played this game wow was that two years ago wild so Every time we go through a year, I think it's best if we, I think it's best if we start with some benchmarks, because it, it's it's kind of hard to rank games until you have a few on the tier list, right? Because it's it's a comparative thing, right? Now, when I first started streaming, well, actually, when I first started making videos on YouTube, I was just a let's player on YouTube. I made a few videos. I did not have a model, it was just my voice, I had a crappy microphone that was hooked up directly into my PlayStation, I recorded the videos from my PlayStation using the PlayStation recording feature, and then I would <laughs> upload them to a USB and then take them to my computer and then upload them and edit them onto uh, my computer and then I would <laughs> export them onto YouTube. It was very arduous, very clumsy. and. Partway through the year, I started streaming, and actually I did my first couple streams on YouTube. So I did a, a test stream with Sengoku Bazaar 4, because I'm very familiar with that game and it was fun. And then I actually streamed most of Persona 5 Strikers on stream, on YouTube. Although I wasn't able to stream the last part of the game, because then it becomes a blocked cutscene, and I couldn't actually use the streaming function there. And then... The year progressed, and eventually I I then streamed Great Ace Attorney 1 and 2 all the way through on YouTube on release day. It, they were very long streams. I don't know how I was able to read for like 8 or 9 hours on end on stream nonstop back then. And then I made the decision to switch to Twitch. And then so when I switched to Twitch, I started with Tales of Arise. Although I did a couple test streams with Tales of Vesperia because I just happened to be finishing that at the time. 
and then the rest from then on was history, right? I went to Twitch, and I vaulted everything onto YouTube, and I had a little stickman model at the beginning instead. Actually, I started. This, actually, no, I started the stickman model with T Ace Attorney. So it was like the summer of 2021. So halfway through the year, I really transitioned into the streaming part. And actually, it was funny because I, when I first started, I kind of vowed that I would not get into the streaming. I was like, I'm just going to make videos. And I don't care if people watch them, but I'm just going to make videos. But I don't know. I think I just like the social aspect of, of streaming. And some of my friends were getting into streaming. And it's been very rewarding. So if we were to start with our, just our 2021 games... Right, Gradient's Attorney is an amazing game. And like I think like the story of Gradient's Attorney, the, the music, the characters, the, the even just like I don't want to say gameplay, but like the logic puzzles that you have, I think are really good. It's like the peak of the Ace Attorney series, which are basically murder mystery games. They're not really attorney games. Now, I kind of want to put it here. Because I feel like for a general audience, it's it's like a really good game. But the pro I think the biggest drawback with it is just it doesn't really have that much replayability, right? Sure, you can go through the cases again, and sure your memory might not remember everything. But in general, you don't really get the same shocks and thrills as the first time you play it, right? Although with this, uh, the Chronicles version of it lets you do chapter select and stuff, which is kind of nice. There's a lot of bonus content. But honestly, like, I love Great Ace Attorney. I think it's a fantastic game. I think everyone needs to play the Great Ace Attorney or watch a playthrough of it, because it's really good. So, I think for, like, if I would say, like, for a general audience, I would put it up here in an A+. Like, if it's just, like, if this was me recommending it to people. But, like, me personally, Great Ace Attorney, fantastic game. So, by extension... Great Ace Attorney 2 is also a fantastic game. Now, I think Great Ace Attorney 2 is better than Great Ace Attorney 1. But the caveat is Great Ace Attorney 2 would not exist without Great Ace Attorney 1 because it's a direct continuation of the plot, which is I'm really glad they released it as one game in total as Chronicles in the West because that means that we get a chance to kind of experience both of them unlike the people in japan when it first came out they had to wait a few years between each of games to get it and you know sometimes you play the second game you're like i don't remember what happened in the first game because it was two or three years ago or whatever it was so but i think two is better than one because i think the mysteries got better the puzzles got better the plot deepened they refined a couple of the mechanics a little bit they added extra music i like the characters in two more than one as well so I have to put them together, but I think two is slightly superior to one. But again, you need both of them, which is, if I was rating this as one game, it would be Great Ace Attorney Chronicles. But I'm going to rate it as two because I feel like it's they're separate enough that I think I can do that. So, hmm, where should we go next? Now, my first game I ever made a video on was actually Spider-Man Miles Morales. It just came out at the time. And I was like, you know, for the longest time, I kind of wanted to make videos on YouTube. Like, I saw Let's Players on YouTube, and I was like, I want to do that. And I think I can do that. But it wasn't really until old, I was older and I had the money, the technology. Um, I mean, streaming is so much more accessible now than it was five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, you know, everyone can do it now. And so, I actually originally thought about streaming back when Tales of Zesteria came out for the first time. But I was going to stream through my PlayStation, and it turns out that entire game is considered a blocked cutscene. So you actually can't stream any of it. Like, some games had only sections of it that were blocked cutscenes because they were spoilery parts. So they didn't want people recording or streaming them with the in-game recording. The entirety of Tales of Zestaria was a blog cutscene. And I didn't really enjoy that game that much anyway, so... I was like, darn it. Maybe it's not my time. But then, I don't know, later on I was kind of like... You know, 2021... 
COVID was just kind of like, well, it didn't just happen. Like we were still, we were like a few months into COVID by then, and people had a better idea of what it was. And I was like, I want to do some streaming. I want to try it. And Spider Man came out with a new game, and you guys know I love Spider Man. So I was like, this is gonna be my year. Twenty twenty one is going to be my year. I'm gonna start with Spider Man. So this Spider Man came out in December twenty twenty. And I recorded the videos and then I published them January 1st, 2021, because I want to start right on the 1st. And this is a great game. I think it's kind of hard to rate this game here without Spider-Man 1 and 2 also on the tier list maker. But because we're going in order of when I stream them, we'll have to account for that too. But I think this is a good game because it's basically, it's like the first Spider-Man game, but it focuses on Miles. And... The story is shorter, there's less side quests to do, it's more compact, it's kind of a spin-off rather than a full game. So, it's a fantastic game, but because it doesn't really have as much content to it, and because the story is very self-contained, there's not that many characters as compared to, like, Spider-Man 1 and Spider-Man 2, where they have a lot of villains, a lot of friendly NPCs, a lot of allies. This game didn't really have that, because it just focused on Miles' story. So, I I want to put the Spider-Man games up here, but I think Miles Morales, still a great game, but I think I have to put it down here because comparatively, it just isn't as fleshed out, but it's not meant to be. It does exactly what it is supposed to be, so I'm okay with that. Now, one of the first games I streamed, well... I guess it's not one of the first games I streamed, but so I my first game I streamed any session of was Senko Kupasara 4. It was literally literally only a couple sessions to test the streaming. And then I did Persona 5 Strikers. And then I took a break from streaming. And then I want to stream Great Ace Attorney. But I didn't I want to test my capabilities because I never streamed before with a little model. So I tested it with these games, Frog Detective 1 and Frog Detective 2, which is frog-themed, right? My friends suggested it to me. My friends were like, you would like this. You like mystery games. You like frogs. And I went into these games thinking that they were going to be like, you know, children's mystery games, right? You go into the game, you collect clues, and then you solve a mystery. And I was half correct. It is There is a mystery, and it's a children's game. Very short, they're each like an hour long, but like there really wasn't much gameplay. Like you talk to people, they ask you to get you to get something, you go get them something, talk to someone else, but it was very linear, and there wasn't really any mystery at all. Like you weren't actually really solving anything. It was just kind of like, oh, I need this book, can you get me this book? And I'll tell you some info. Oh, you got me this book, here's some info. But I guess what I'm trying to say is, they're cute games. They're made by a small developer. Cute graphics. They're not really supposed to be, like, fully fleshed out, like, actual mystery games. So, I think it'd be unfair for me to be putting it here. I think, like, I would probably rank it somewhere in, like, the C tier. But I feel like it's still unfair, because I don't think that's what they meant to do with these games. So, I'm actually going to put these games down here in the special tier. They're kind of like, these games are kind of to be judged in and of themselves. They're not really, you know, fully fleshed out experiences meant to hold your attention for hours and keep you coming back and playing. Now, Frog Detective 2 is a little bit more interactive than Frog Detective 1. So I'm going to put it ahead because there's like a, there's a part where you get to like arrange stickers on a sticker boat. Um... I still have yet to play Frog Detective 3. I was going to, I'm was i actually going to do that. It's actually in my Steam library. I just haven't gotten around to it. I just know it's going to be a short experience. So I guess I just haven't like had time to slot it in to a full stream of its own. But I will, I will get to Frog Detective 2. So I think... And again, these tiers might move around as we go, as I put down other games. So there's a real chance that I'll move these around, or maybe I will move them into C tier. Um... Sengoku Basara 4 is an amazing game. I think Sengoku Basara 4 
I mean, the, the Bizarre games in general have really fun characters. The gameplay is really fun. It comes from, like, the developers behind Devil May Cry, so it's, like, very stylish. But unlike Devil May Cry, where there's only a couple of playable characters, there's, like, a giant cast of, like, almost 50 playable characters here. And the music's fantastic. They have great personalities, despite there's so many of them. And despite the fact that it's very humorous as well, there's also a lot of, like, really serious moments, too. I think the biggest drawback of this game is that it's only in Japanese. Um, very few Basara games have come and been localized English, and they the localizations have not been super amazing, so it hasn't really taken off here. So you have to get a Japanese copy, and then you, if you don't know Japanese, you kind of have to follow along some guides to figure out where everything's on the menu. But once you figure it out, like once you get into the battle, it's just, you know, you know the controls, you hit the buttons, you mash buttons, you look really cool. I think my favorite thing about Basara is that it's very easy to get into and just mash buttons, and you'll look, you'll look really cool regardless. So there's like a low floor, but there's a high ceiling because if you play it on really high difficulties, you actually really need to know what you're doing. Certain moves cancel into other moves or certain moves combo into other moves really well. There's like a finesse to it. Um, even the normal enemies are more intimidating than the bosses because the whole point is there's limited healing, which means that you also have to be mindful of every little hit you get from the little regular enemies as opposed to the bosses, where you might be fighting them one-on-one. -on -one. So, now I don't know if this goes above Ace Attorney or not, because it is an action game, and it has a lot of replayability. And honestly, like, the character designs and the stories and everything, I feel like I have to put it above, because replayability and lots of characters to choose from, you can kind of choose the way you go through the game, which lets you really customize your experience. So I think Basara 4, for now, I'm going to put it above the Great Ace Attorney. And I don't know, maybe maybe Great Ace Attorney will get bumped down to A+, later. We'll see. Um, Shin Megami Tensei 5 is an RPG game. And it's actually really good. I think the battle system in this game is fantastic. It very much is like Pokemon. Which is kind of weird to say. You collect demons, you teach them different skills, there's certain rules on what they can learn and what they can't learn, and the battle system's actually... It's not like hard hard, but it is... If you don't know what you're doing, it can be a little bit unforgiving. And the super boss in the game was actually quite challenging. I spent a lot of time preparing for that boss, and I did it on a stream, and even like the boss fight itself was like over an hour. Maybe even no, I don't. I don't think it was two hours, but it was challenging. I had to do a lot of preparation. And that was just on easy. Well, not easy. I think it was normal mode. I didn't fight the boss on hard mode because that was be that would be too much. But I think like a lot of people go into Shin Megami Tensei thinking that it's going to be like Persona, and it kind of is because of the battle system. But it doesn't have any of like the social link aspects or any of like you know the the everyday life aspects, right? Which is part of what people like about Persona. So if you're going into Shin Megami Tensei thinking it's going to be Persona, you're going to be disappointed. And I kind of was of that boat. I was kind of hoping the story would be a bit better. Honestly, I thought the story would be a little bit more fleshed out. But it was still good. That being said, Shin Megami Tensei 5 is very similar to Shin Megami Tensei 3, which I also played, which is an older game remastered. Now, Shin Megami Tensei 3 is kind of a cult classic, and honestly, Shin Megami Tensei 5 is basically just a better version of Shin Megami Tensei 3. Sparse story, not that many NPCs, lots of demons to collect, tough battle system. I think the thing I like about 3 more than 5 is that they're actually like puzzles in the dungeons, and I keep saying this, but a lot of JRPGs nowadays don't really have puzzles in the dungeons anymore because people don't really like puzzles but i like puzzles if they're well written puzzles and actually the puzzles were pretty good the only problem is this game also had random encounters kind of like pokemon so it is a cult classic it's fun but i think going back to it and playing it again it didn't not to say it doesn't it, it still holds up but it pales in comparison to at least like five which the time hadn't come out with the remaster here. I'm not sure if I should put it in A- or B+. 
I think it's still a good game. I feel like it's going to end up somewhere down here, like the lower end of A-. minus. But I think for now, I think this is fair for now. Yeah, I love dungeon puzzles. Like, very few RPGs have really good dungeon puzzles. I think Tales of Symphonia has really good dungeon puzzles. Shadow Hearts 2 has really good dungeon puzzles. Shit Make Me Tensei 3 actually has pretty decent dungeon puzzles, I think. I try to think of other games more recently that actually had interesting puzzles to them. But my mind is drawing a blank. I know we played at least one recently that had... Oh, actually, no. Star Ocean 2 Remake actually had some good dungeon puzzles. Not, like, incredible, but they were, like, interesting. I think I'll leave it here for now. This might change. This order might change. Yeah, like, Zelda has really good ones, too. Metroid Prime. Yeah, those, those are great examples. Not RPGs, but they still have really good, like, dungeon design and puzzles, right? Yeah. Um, Hades. Hades is a fantastic game. I was surprised how much I liked Hades. I already knew, like, stylistically, it was really good. But, like, there's just so... The characters have so much personality. There's so... Even though... I don't really like roguelikes that much. Because you're just doing the same thing over and over again. But, I don't know. It was just really fun in this game. There's so many weapons to try. Different bosses to encounter. Different rooms you can encounter. You can customize the way you use your weapons. You can customize the way you select the boons to get certain builds. And you can kind of customize it into playing it the way you want. Now, I think Hades is definitely an A plus tier, at least. I think after a while it gets kind of boring. Like once you play like 50, 60, 70 hours of this, then you kind of get bored. But that's like the length of a regular game. So I think I have to put it behind Spider Man though, because I don't know. Something about the isometric view. And there aren't as many cool attack animations. Like, they're cool, but they're kind of simplified, right? As opposed to, like, I just love watching Spider-Man zip around and do acrobatic punches and stuff like that, too. So I, I think this is a pretty fair... I think this is a pretty fair assessment for now. Yeah, I, I, so I got you into Hades, too, Sai, right? When I played it during that Thankmas stream, I think it was. And And I know you really enjoy Hades, so I'm glad that... You discovered a new game through that. So I think Hades, I think it's fair to be up here. Mm, Tales of Arise. Tales of Arise was actually a really good game. Um, but I don't think I can justify putting it in A+. I think for me personally, I really liked it up here because of Law. <laughs> He's just super fun to play. He's like exactly the type of gameplay I enjoy. Now, drawbacks to... Tales, no multiplayer this time, but I think that's because the battle system was different. Like you had an over-the-camera ba like battle system, and that wouldn't really work with multiplayer in the way they usually do. It's a shame, though. It would have been really fun to play with friends. The story, I think... Okay, so... I've talked about this before, but I guess I'll rant about Tales. Like, I love Tales of Symphonia. I love Tales of the Abyss. Those games are some of my favorites of all time because of the story in them. But ever since then, I haven't really found other Tales games that have captured that same amount of good storytelling. I think Exilia got close, but wasn't quite there. I think, like a lot of the other games, like Graces was fun, but it was very campy. But I know that the, that the team behind Graces was the one who wrote, like, Destiny and not Team Fantasia, who's the one who wrote... Um, Abyss and Symphonia. Now, Zestaria really disappointed me. I really didn't like the battle system in Zestaria, which is weird because you think the Tails battle system is pretty foolproof. How do you mess that up? I didn't really like the battle system, and the story was not good. I did not like... I, I found very few redeeming qualities about that story. A lot of people only like it because of Stray and Miglio, which is fine, but I don't think they're enough to carry that game on its own. Or a lot of people like it because it was their first entry into the Tales series. Because prior to Zestaria, they didn't really market a lot of their Tales games very well. But I felt like Zestaria was on a decline for the Tales series. And by extension, Berseria was also in the same universe as Zestaria, because it's a prequel. It was better, but I still didn't really like it. So, 
I don't know. I feel like I feel like either a lot of people love Zestaria or you don't like Zestaria, and I'm on the don't like team. At the same time, the Tail Studio has been doing a lot of gacha games, mobile gacha games, and each one fails. They run it for a couple months, a year or two, and then they close the servers, and then they immediately start another gacha game. And it's like they've I've I've played at least like four or five Tails gacha games. Now I've given up. I don't I don't play any more of their games on Gacha or mobile because they're not good. And they keep closing the servers. Like, what's the point? If I do want to spend money on it, I'm just gonna get it taken away from me. So I know in Tales of the Rays is still going in Japan, but the the English or the international servers are down. So what I'm trying to say is the Tales series has lost a lot of goodwill from me. Because it used to be my top favorite series. So with the rise, I was kind of skeptical and I didn't want to get my hopes up. But like the battle system and the character personalities really brought me back. The antagonists weren't amazing, but they were better than Grace's or Zestaria's enemies. So the overall story of Arise is actually not bad. It is a little bit, there's some parts where it's kind of like, oh, this is like oversimplified racism or whatever it is, right? But, like, it's still, I think, it still does a good job of getting across its points. But the last third of the game really drops the ball. And now that we've recently played Tales of Arise DLC two years later, it does help in showing some of that up, but it didn't quite fix everything. So what I'm trying to say is, like, I know a lot of people still don't like Arise, but I think Arise is on is a good indication of the of the, the return to the tales that I think I would normally like. So I don't think I could give it an A+, but I think I could feel very justified in putting it here in the A tier. Now, here's a hot take. Tales of Vesperia. Um, a lot of people love this game. And I like it. Like, the battle system is pretty much exactly the same as Tales of the Abyss, which is fine because I like the battle system. The characters in the party, I think for the most part, very enjoyable. Tales, you know, dynamics between the characters. I think it was quite weak in the overall plot. I think the antagonist, not interesting. Overall plot seems a little bit disjointed. So I'm going to put it behind Tales of Rise, but I think it's better than Shin Megami Tensei 5 because I like the battle system. Now, a lot of people really like Vesperia because they really like Yuri, the main character. He's very popular. And I've talked about this before. Personally, I don't really like Yuri. I think he's okay. I think my only my biggest problem with Yuri is that he, he he does get character development, but it's not really like he doesn't really change his perspective much in the game. He's just kind of like I'm gonna do it my way, and if you don't like that, then whatever. But he never, and I thought that maybe, like, especially his conflict with his childhood friend Flynn, like, Yuri's a little bit more like, you know, I'm gonna do things my way, and if it breaks the law, then whatever. And then Flynn's like, well, no, we need to do things within the confines of the law, but I know that the law is not always correct, but I'm gonna follow it anyways, because that's my job. And those are two very different opposing viewpoints. And I was expecting both of them to find some kind of middle ground, and yeah, that'd be the lesson, right? Like, it's, it's a little bit of both. But in the end, it was just kind of like, Yuri never really learns his lesson, and he and he never gets a chance to be proven wrong. And Flynn just eventually just joins him and goes along with that idea. So I wish that there was I wish that the way Yuri was written, he's a little bit too perfect. And I don't really agree with that. But it's still a good game. But it's definitely not it didn't reach the heights of Abyss. And Symphonia for me. But I'm glad I finally got to play it. Because this game was originally on Xbox only. And there was a Japanese PS3 version. I have the Japanese PS3 version. But I don't know enough Japanese to actually appreciate the plot. So when it finally got released. Remastered. In English. It was really really nice. Um, to actually finally be able to play that. Now I didn't actually stream this whole game on stream. When I was about to stream Tales of Arise. I needed a game to test my streams with. And I actually just finished Tales of Vesperia that summer. Um, when Tales of Vesperia Remastered came out, I, I played it, and I didn't finish it. I liked it, but I only got so far because I guess I got bored of the story. So then when Arise was 
coming out, I was like, I should finish Vesperia. I should go back and finish it. So I went back and finished it that month. I think it was August because Arise came out in September. And I finished it and I was like, well, I need some, I need something to do test streams with. So I went and I did test streams with Vesperia doing post-game content. So I think there's like three VODs of this on my channel of just post-game content, but it's not an actual full Let's Play. But I thought I'd include it here anyways. Maybe in the future I would like to go back and actually do a full playthrough of this on stream. But it's a, it's a lengthy enough game that I don't really feel inclined to do that right away. Um, Devil May Cry. This game, I, I like Devil May Cry 4 a lot because I like Nero. And, you know, when they, when they, the next game that came after was the DMC reboot that no one liked. And I was disappointed that we wouldn't get to play as Nero again. But then Devil May, 5, Devil May Cry 5 came out and Nero's playable in that one too. And I like Nero, but I like his appearance in 4 a little bit better. Plus in 4 he has the cool devil arm that you can grab enemies with and like punch the heck out of them. You can't really do that here until end game. You get like his mechanical arm, but it doesn't really do the same thing. It's like a grappling hook almost. Now this game also only has a couple of playable characters, but that's more than the other Devil May Cry games. It's also really short. This game was actually really short. So it was a good game. It was a little on the short side. Yes, you can go back and replay it and and try out different things and try different difficulties, but I wish there was also like more boss encounters and more enemy models. That's always my problem with Devil May Cry games, is that there's not that many different types of enemy variety. There's definitely more in this game than there were in the other games. I think for now I'll put it here. It might I might even drop it down to A minus, but I think it's actually still a pretty good game. And actually, like for the longest time, I didn't play Devil May Cry 5 for some reason. And then it was after I started making videos, I was like, you know what? I, I This game's been sitting on my shelf. I think it's time that we go play it. So I went ahead and did it on stream or on video and recorded it. Um, so I think I think this is a fair. This is a fair. Persona 5 Strikers was actually also a really good game. I think I actually like it more than I like it more than Vesperia. That's a really good question. I think I did. I think I don't really like Persona spin-off games usually unless they actually continue the story. Like I I not I decided not to play Persona 5 Tactica because it's it, I think it's all non-canon and it happens like during the story of Persona 5. But this one is an actual sequel. And I was a bit skeptical because Koei Warrior games, in my opinion, are just inferior versions of Basara. They're usually a little bit repetitive and the characters usually don't have much personality. So I thought it was going to be like one of those games. I didn't know it would actually have a full-on story. And the story is basically exactly a continuation of Persona 5. Minus the social link stuff, which of course everyone likes that stuff. So, But it was kind of fun. Like They go on a road trip and you get to do dungeon crawling, and there's actually bosses and character development. Some of the fights were kind of BS. You know what, actually, I'm going to drop my score because of that. Some of the fights were a little bit BS. Like, even on, like, normal difficulty, like, the first boss of the game, if she she did, like, a big, like, she would do an attack where she just, like, charged around the field, and if she, like, so much as slightly hit you, like, that'd be, like, three quarters of your HP, like, gone. Like, it was a little bit ridiculous. So there were a couple times where the it was a little bit unfair, but like like the core of the battle system was still pretty good. And I think the fact that it actually continues the Persona 5 story in a fun way, um, I think that's the biggest strength of this game. I do want to stream Persona 5 Royal one day. It's just a really, really long game. It's a really long game. I will be doing Persona 3 Reloaded, so I think maybe when we do Persona 3 Reloaded, afterwards maybe I'll make my way through Persona 4 Golden and then Persona 5 Royal. Maybe we can make that our next Umineko series. Like, we'll do it once a week or something like that. It's just, it's really long. It's really good, but it's really long. I think for now I'll put it here. I think that's a fair assessment. I think strictly in battle system, though, Shin Megami Tensei 5 might be better. But, you know, story, I really, I really value story. Okay, we're almost done with 2000, 
2021. I the Somnium Files. Uh, now this is gonna hurt some people's feelings. Uh, it was still an okay game. So, okay, I the Somnium Files is written by the same people who did Zero Escape. So, Zero Escape has some pretty good writing. Like, the, it's like mind-bending plot stuff, right? So I really wanted more of that. And I found out that I, the Somnium Files, I was like, I never heard of this game before, but it's written by the same people who wrote Zero Escape. And so I was like, let's give it a try. Now, when I played this game, I had the unfortunate luck. Like, this game has multiple story paths, right? Before you get the true ending. I pretty much, on my first playthrough of the game on stream, got, like, the worst story path. And when I say worst story path, I don't mean, like, worst as in bad things happen. I mean worst as in... It was just a bad storyline, like poorly written, and I was very disappointed. I almost thought of dropping the game after that first storyline, but I power through, and it actually gets better because all the other story paths are a lot better, and you actually find out later in the game that the story path, the one that I went through first, was actually supposed to be intentionally poorly written, but because it was my first one, I didn't really get that. Now, my problem with this game, like, in the end, I think the conclusion was good. Like, it was a good game, it had a fair mystery, it had enough, like, weird world shenanigans, like, Zero Escape style. My problem with this game is, like, some a lot of the characters were, like, juvenile sense of humor. Per like, making pervy jokes type of thing. And I can stand that when it's one or two characters doing that, but when in this game, it's like, three or four characters doing that. And I didn't appreciate that. But it brought it around. So, like, overall, I think I liked it. I might even drop it down to a B tier, honestly. But maybe not. I don't think it was, like... It wasn't, like... It's not a bad game. But also, like, the puzzles... I call them puzzles because they're supposed to be puzzles, but they're not really puzzles. Because, like, all the puzzle sequences happen in, like, dreams. So things don't really logically completely make sense. They, like, make sense in a weird dream sort of way. So, I think for now I'll leave it up here. I know a lot of people really like this game, and they have fond memories of it. I just don't think it lives up to Zero Escape's name. But it's not a bad series. I might drop it later. Like, in tier. We'll see. We'll shuffle things around. And then, I also put Animal Crossing here, because Animal Crossing... Uh, I did it for the th my first Thankmas stream. We did three sessions of Animal Crossing. It was really fun. We decorated um, on like the DLC islands and stuff. Animal Crossing is just a great game. Like, there's flaws for sure, but also like it had the very it was very fortuitous that it dropped like right around the time COVID was at its peak, and so a lot of people just didn't have any choice but to stay home and just play Animal Crossing. So. It's a very charming game. There's a lot of customization. The island, being able to decorate your island is such a great idea compared to in the past where you wouldn't really be able to decorate your town that much. It was only like the indoor sections you could really, really decorate. Of course, the decorating is not all encompassing, but some people get really creative with it. So I think it's up here. Um, but I wouldn't really put it above these games. Like It's a casual game. It's a game you just kind of play for fun. It's kind of, you know, it doesn't, you don't have an objective, right? You just kind of do your own thing, which is kind of nice. So that brings us to the end of 2021, actually. Now, 2021, like my first year of streaming or making videos, my original goal was we just do one game per month. So this is like, it's not 12 games, it's like, what, 15 games? But, um,. My goal was like, you do one game, I do one game a month. So I would record videos, for example, Spider-Man. I would record the videos, I would queue them up for the month, and then I would just take a break for the rest of the month until February. And then I would upload the February videos, and then I would just take a break, and then not do anything until March. And Because I didn't really expect to be doing this that much. And then there's a couple games, like for example, Great Ace Attorney 1 and 2 were kind of together, and then... Like, Frog Detective, each of these was only one stream, so I didn't really count them. And Animal Crossing was a charity stream. 
and Tales of Vesperia was only like a couple streams. So there's a couple exceptions to the one month rule, but for the most part, it was one game per month. Okay.